Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to session number two of Reset Land Management Boot Camp. I'm your host, Ryan Graven. To my left here is my man, Jeremy Ness. Yes, we're wearing matching t-shirts. Yes, he looks fantastic in those glasses. Fun story about those glasses. We actually found them together along with the sales team on a 45-mile hike across the Pacific Crest Trail. True story. That's not what we're here to talk about today. Today, we are here to talk about um, troubleshooting techniques and network monitoring tools that we put in place to help our clients be optimized and healthy 24-7, 365. In our first session of Reset, we really covered the foundation, right? How do we set up a network appropriately from the ground up? How do we measure, measure how our spanning tree is set up? How do we know if uh, QoS is set up appropriately? Basically, all the tools that lay the foundation for a healthy network. Uh, this session is way more about the day-to-day -day management of your land infrastructure. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the guru of technology himself, Mr. Jeremy Ness. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, the second session is titled Monitoring and Troubleshooting. So in the first session, we set up uh, a really great network in terms of uh, architecture and then went over the settings, as Ryan mentioned, of, you know, correct spanning tree and uh, correct quality service, and then uh, touched on, on wireless at the end. So um, now that we have that set up, how do we do kind of that day two operations, right? Uh, how do we do the care and feeding, monitor, make sure everything is working correctly? So uh, first place we're gonna start is actually measuring uh, or monitoring the infrastructure itself, right? So this is my firewalls, switches, uh, wireless controller and the access point. So, um, there's really, you know, a few ways to go about this, right? Uh, the first one I've listed here is ICMP, right? The Internet Control Message Protocol um, has the feature of echo and response. Most of us would refer that as ping, right? So what does ping give us when it comes to monitoring our network? Uh, well, if something doesn't answer, it's down. So we get kind of the up-down status. Uh, generally also get uh, response time latency. Right? How long did that packet take to get to that endpoint and back? Uh, generally, we'd expect that to be uh, you know, sub one millisecond on our local area network. So again, if we see that higher, that could be uh, a sign of either saturation or queues you know, filling up in, in my switches or, or firewall. Um, and then we also get TTL. Uh, not that important for monitoring. Um, however, do want to speak to TTL a little bit um, if you've ever been curious. Uh, as I mentioned, kind of spanning tree on, on the last session, right? Um, when on the LAN Ethernet, um, there's no mechanism for a packet to die, right? It just goes around forever to where TTL, that's the time to live. Every time we traverse a layer three boundary, uh, we decrement that TTL. Uh, that's the mechanism to keep uh, the internet of being a wash of just random packets, right? That's a nice amount of layer three architecture versus a layer two architecture. So um, tools in this space uh, might be like Ping Potter Pro and there's a few other ones, right? But an ICMP is really kind of the most basic uh, measurement we have in terms of the up down status and latency. If we actually want any real information from our devices, uh, the next protocol, SNMP, being the simple network management protocol, is really kind of the workhorse in this space and has been really for several decades. Um, with SNMP, uh, it's kind of a counter and text-based system um, to where I can pull a device and, again, uh, typically get back kind of point-in-time uh, counter information. So um, in SNMP, there's a notion of an agent, uh, an SNMP agent. That's actually the device itself. Uh, it's the agent. And then there's a generally SNMP manager, right? It's the thing that, that then goes and, and pulls uh, SNMP. So uh, in SNMP, as I mentioned, it's generally counter-based. So, hey, in this interface, tell me, you know, how many, you know, bits a second there are. Hey, for the CPU, tell me that the percentage used, right? For RAM, tell me how much is used. Hard drive space, tell me how much is used, right? So again, we're going to get back some, generally some kind of numeric or floating point or, or whatever, right? Some kind of um, you know, number. So we talk about SNMP. Uh, there's kind of a dictionary called the MIB. Uh, that stands for the Management Informa Information Base. Um, so it's kind of the dictionary, if you will, of um, you know items that you can pull. Those individual items are called OIDs, or just object identifiers. So if you've ever seen a, a, an SNMP OID, uh, it generally uh, starts with a one and has a period, next number, period, period, period. If you kind of think about it, you're branching down a tree, right? Uh, hey, I want to go look at the interfaces portion of this, and then I want to look at the sub-interface, and so on and so forth, as you traverse down the tree. Uh, there's a notion of walking a MIB, right? That's kind of walking down that, that tree. Um, 
as uh, I put down here, right, we have a few different versions of SNMP. Version one is a really legacy and dead, never going to be used in any modern architecture. Uh, version 2C is kind of the general day-to-day. -day. Um, the security around that is a community string, right? So uh, it's just a static, you know, uh, text or numeric string. Um, and it typically has the, the attributes of read-only or read-write. Pretty um, odd to do writes. I mean, you can. There's some basic configuration you can try to do over SNMP. Again, that's not the way that we traditionally are going to administrate our, our infrastructure. Um, version 2C, uh, again, has the community string and is in the clear. Right? So anytime we you know, send it the string and, and get data back, um, again, in the clear. So that can be an information disclosure. Um, if you have a man in the middle or if you use the, leave the community string, um, the default, which is generally always public, lowercase public. So it's always a good, good idea to change that. Again, uh, anybody else would be able to you know, query your switches or firewall or access points. And again, no security risk, more than just an information disclosure, right? Uh, next, we'll move on to version three. Um, that's kind of uh, really the same guts as version 2C uh, in terms of OID and, 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 and um, the MIB and kind of the, you know, how we interact on a, on a protocol basis, except we do add username and password authentication uh, and we add encryption for the, the whole thing, right? So no longer are we in the clear. Um, and as we kind of touched on last time, right, um, on wireless, we don't really like pre-share keys because it's hard to rotate them, revoke them if we need to. Same with that community string, right? Um, it can be difficult to, to, to revoke it. Um, we can have generally multiple community strings depending on the switch. Enterprise very much so, um, you know, kind of consumer or prosumer, um, not as much. Then the last thing on, on SNMP I'll touch on is traps. Um, these are kind of like sending logs out, right? So again, SNMP is a, a polling model to where I, you know, request information on the device generally every minute or every five minutes using tooling, which I'll touch on here shortly. And then traps is the ability for the agents to send me something, right? So, um, you know, we can receive SNMP traps, uh, again, very similar to kind of logging. Um, beyond, um, again, ICMP and SNMP, um, there are things that the, the CLI we very much need, right? So SNMP, uh, a lot of times won't uh, give you me, you know, MAC address table or ARP table or, uh, the route table or, um, you know, things like uh, my, my neighbors, right, via LLDP or CDP, you know, link layer your discovery protocol and the, the Cisco discovery protocol. So um, there are tools that kind of do the screen scraping, right? So they'll SSH in your device um, and they'll do those commands and gather that data. Um, however, that can be difficult, right? Um, the tooling software needs to know exactly what the model is and oftentimes what the firmware version is, right? A um, good example of, you know, from uh, Cisco iOS 12 to 15, right, there was um, command changes, right? Um, does it show Mac dash address or just show Mac space address, right? Those are going to, you know, yield us different results. So, um, and when we do screen scraping, uh, if you can think about it, right, that's not a structured table, right? There's, you know, spaces or tabs or whatever it is. So parsing that can also be difficult, but it's an important part of information that, that we need. Um, lastly, uh, APIs. This can be the most modern way to query uh, any of your network devices. Uh, as you know, uh, we're big Cisco Meraki fans here at Matrix Networks. And um, due to the fact it's controller based, right, it has that dashboard, you can actually query the API on the dashboard um, and get tons of information and also do programming, right? And APIs give us a really structured way to where we don't care what the software is underneath as long as it expose similar APIs. Um, you know, we're going to get the same result, right? We don't care what the model is, right? Again, same, same concept as long as they uh, don't change those APIs, which uh, generally um, you don't, right? Gives us a structured um, data. Uh, again, I mentioned Meraki, but other controller-based solutions also do that for other network here, right? So if you have a Forda manager, you can query that over API. Uh, if you have to have a Cisco DNA, if like an SD access you know, deployment, again, you can query it and, and, and it'll give you the device health. Um, same with, you know, Panorama if you're a uh, Palo Alto shop. Uh, that's also how we monitor all of our uh, SD-WAN um, for our clients, right? The, the uh, Meraki's or CloudGenix or Bella Cloud or Okido Networks, right? Um, those are all controller-based. So again, um, we're able to get, you know, um, device and um, uh, circuit information uh, as far as circuit health from the uh, controller. So uh, again, if we're talking about the actual network devices, these are kind of the traditional ways to pull those things, right? Uh, and again, uh, I did throw some products on here. Um, Matrix does not sell uh, most of these, do not use most of these. 
uh, you know, we really treat these education sessions as trying to just be agnostic, um, right? And this is not a sales pitch, this is purely education. So uh, with that, again, I did throw on, um, on the left-hand side, kind of the, the biggest, um, you know, paid for supported, right? So the wins being that 10,000 pound gorilla, um, of course, with the supply chain, kind of got a bad rap, but um, in terms of, you know, features and capabilities, SolarWinds is, is right up there um, in the SNMP based. And then uh, I'll touch on kind of additional um, ways to monitor our network that SolarWinds encompasses all of that. Uh, PRTG, also a, a big one. Um, uh, we used to use it uh, for our network service. Uh, we've actually moved on to another one down the list called Avic. Uh, but again, pretty, you know, traditional SNMP based um, monitoring solution. Manage engine, again, same thing, right? It's just a, a larger one. Um, those ones are, uh, are kind of all on-premises deployments. These next three are more cloud-based uh, deployments, right? So again, Avic, I'll actually be um, briefly touching on Avic and how we use it to support our clients. Um, but again, you can do the same in your environment in terms of, of monitoring. Uh, again, Datadog, Logic Monitor, they do a lot more than SMP-based stuff, but um, that is a, an option um, of their, their portfolios. And on the right-hand side are kind of the free open source, um, well, free and or open source. Um, so Negios, it's been around forever. If you've been in the industry long, I'm sure you've heard of Negios. Um, Cacti, I was amazed when I was kind of doing research for this. Went to their GitHub page and there are still commits like as of you know, the last year. Um, I kind of thought it had died on the vine, but um, it's all near to my heart, something I've used um, you know, uh, many times uh, for you know, personal use cases. Uh, Zabbix, yeah, another great one, Spiceworks, uh, Microtik the Dude, see that fairly often. Um, and if you really want to roll your own, uh, Prometheus um, being a time-based kind of uh, time series tool, and then Grafina, an actually gorgeous um, kind of GUI overlay to uh, time series data. So again, uh, a lot of ways, this is not um, exhaustive at all. There are a zillion of these tools. Uh, they all, you know, uh, different price points and, and different feature sets. So. Uh, you know, choose one that's right for your network. Uh, you should always have something watching your equipment. So, um, again, yeah, SNMP um, and, and all those, right, CLI and, and thing, um, those give me metrics and counters and configuration data. Um, so it could tell me that, you know, uh, interfaces have a lot of bandwidth, right? Hey, there's, you know, several hundred megabits flowing across these two interfaces. But it does not tell me what that data is or who's talking, right? It's purely just a counter, it's just a number. It's a percentage of this interface is used, a percentage of the CPU is used, right? What's actually going across my network? What's actually using the bandwidth? And to solve that answer, uh, we need to look at network flows. So in general terms, a network flow is any communication between endpoints on my network, right? So um, if you have two endpoints and a TCP conversation, we have our three-way handshake, right? The SYN, SYNAC, and ACK. Once we see that complete, we know we have a flow, right? These two endpoints are, are talking and have flows. UDP can be more difficult to, to see flows just because it's um, connectionless, right? But if we see two ports talking to each other for a certain amount of time, you know, we know that that's a, a network flow, right? So um, flow information is really just metadata, right? Specifically, it doesn't have that payload, right? Um, you know, a, a normal packet, uh, Ethernet frame, I should say, 1500 bytes. Um, you know, very few of that, right? 32 bytes or whatever is going to be the header. The rest of that's going to be the payload, right? So uh, here, uh, the next bullet point on the slide, flow data is really the source IP address, the destination IP address, the protocol, the um, port numbers on either side, right? Source and destination port number and the size. Um, as you can see, these things are, are generally all layer three. So flow information is a, a layer three function. Um, and I'll touch on, on that here shortly. Um, in flows, um, any flow uh, protocols, there's a notion of an exporter. So that's going to be my actual device, right? my firewall, my switch, my wireless controller, um, whatever it is. And then there's a collector, right? Again, something needs to consume that flow information, store it in a database, and then show it to you, right? So um, again, that's the job of the collector. A lot of those tools on the previous page I showed you um, can also be collectors uh, either out of the box or via a license. Um, kind of one of the big uh, ones um, that is a freemium model is NTOP. Uh, NTOP's a really great uh, flow collector. So uh, we're talking about uh, network flows. There are several different types of, of flow protocols. So NetFlow is the first, it's Cisco, it's proprietary. Um, but uh, 
you know, again, it really kind of started everything, right? So as you can see, there are several versions. Uh, five and nine are really the most common. 10 is kind of a reference to uh, the next version, which I'll touch on here shortly. Um, the next one uh, is S-Flow. So again, NetFlow is Cisco proprietary. Uh, a lot of the, the manufacturers and industry got together and said, hey, we want our own flow protocol too. So S-Flow is sample flow is what that stands for. Um, and uh, you'll see that across many, many, many types of devices will have S-Flow. Um, and these are not mix and match, right? These are not interchangeable. You need NetFlow collector or an S-Flow uh, collector, right? So yeah, neither of these were standards-based in terms of having an RFC um, or, or anything like that. Um, other examples are, um, you know, uh, Juniper has their own, Huawei has their own, Citrix has their own. Uh, again, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, you know different kind of flows out there where everybody just kind of rolled their own. And um, the last one is IP fix. So that stands for Internet Protocol Flow Information Exchange. Um, so that really is based on NetFlow 9. When we say NetFlow 10, there really is no NetFlow 10. It's more of a placeholder for, hey, we're going to switch over to IP fix. Um, our IP fix does have an RFC. It is industry standard. And it's really where we're seeing all flow information move to. Uh, is all based around IP fix. Again, structurally very similar to, to, to that NetFlow 9, which has kind of been the, the king of the hill um, for, for many years now. Um, again, this is layer uh, three, as I mentioned. So um, I do want to do a quick whiteboard here to kind of show where in the network we can do flows um, and maybe some shortcomings that, that you want to think about um, when, when getting flow information. So uh, again, if we're going to kind of start with our, our basic network here, um, you know, we're going to have a firewall and uh, simplistically just say we have a single switch um, and you know we have a, a server over there and you know, an end user. So uh, again, with any flow information generally being layer three, what can you do on a layer three interface, right? So this is a layer two switch, right? Uh, generally not capable of exporting uh, network flows. So uh, what's the main layer three uh, interface on my network? It's going to be the LAN side of the firewall. So from there, if we did have a, a NetFlow collector, right, we're able to export those flows from the firewall. Firewalls generally have built in some flow information, right? Your firewall probably has some application dashboard or um, you know wh whatever they want to call it, right? Um, and generally, it's going to be real time or it's going to be you know an, an X amount of time in the past, right? We don't think of firewalls as having a whole lot of storage, right? Uh, there are a few, um, but generally um, these things are, are very short, right? So retention on that flow information is, is pretty short. It's generally a little bit more of a troubleshooting tool in the, the now and present than something historical. So uh, most firewalls do allow for the capability to do NetFlow or SFlow or IPFix or, or, or whatever it is, right? Um, but kind of the, the problem we run into is, right, this end user is gonna access something off the server it never hits that layer three boundary, right? We're not gonna see that traffic. So any east-west traffic um, on the land we miss, we only get that north-south traffic, right? As um, information leaves, leaves our environment. So um, if we really want that kind of land side information, right? We need to move that layer three down onto the switch, right? But we still might miss that, right? If we have a layer three switch and it just has VLAN one, um, Again, manufacturers differ here in terms of implementations, but oftentimes, if you know uh, a VLAN one and it's layer three, and I try and export from that VLAN one, I'm still not crossing a boundary. I don't really hit layer three when I talk to that other um, device on my network, right? So um, even here with a layer three switch and it's exporting flows, right? Good chance I'm not going to see that um, that imp or that flow information. So really, you know. I need to be on VLAN one over here and you know VLAN two over here. And VLAN one is gonna be where I export you know, flow information. Um, you know, as I kind of hit that, at that point I get that that visibility, um, you know, being able to, to traverse that that um, that layer three boundary. So uh, again, when we talk flow information, it does really matter where I am you know exporting those flows from. All right, so um, again, flows are great. Gives me that metadata, tells me who's talking to who. 
but maybe that's not enough. Maybe I do need to see payloads. And maybe I care about the end user experience. Right? Again, flows will tell me somebody talked to somebody, but you know, how long did DNS take? How long did that database transaction take? Right? How long did that website take to you know, send these packets back and forth, right? To, to actually load uh, the TLS handshake, right? So um, this is kind of another you know, category, another step um, as being able to get that kind of information on my network, right? My network experience and full traffic visibility, right? Not just metadata, the full payload. So to get this information on my network, there's a few approaches. So uh, mirror port or span port, um, again, depending on the manufacturer, I might call it something different. Um, this ability to say, hey, I want to take this network port and any traffic that ingresses or egresses through that, I want it all that to be mirrored over to some other port. Right, so um, once I do that, you know, I can mirror some amount of ports or uplinks or whatever, um, and then whatever's sitting on that mirror port or span port, right? They get all the traffic. Um, there are many products uh, here on the bottom left. You'll see I'll touch on shortly. Can consume all that, right? They're really just getting a, a, a copy, you know, a full copy of the whole 1500 byte packet frame or whatever it is, right? Um, so uh, again, getting that information on my network to some kind of collector or storage database. Mirror port or span port is one of those, um, which again, done in software. Uh, sometimes there's an ASIC in the switch to, to do that. But again, if it is done in software on the switch, uh, which a lot of, again, the, the lower end, that is the case, this can be a little bit taxing, right? Opposed to sending out one port and sending out multiples, and then depending on how much speed you have, um, so on and so forth. And then network tap. This is generally more mechanical, right? This is like, you know, putting something on the copper cable and it, you know, takes electrical signals off the wire or more commonly done in, in, in fiber, right? When you have that light, you can actually kind of, you know, tap into that and get a portion of the light um, be an actual signal. Uh, I've heard that the NSA has some, some experience uh, with this. So um, again, getting some products, this is not extensive. Um, these are just ones that, that I'm uh, know of and familiar with, right? Um, my answer, um, again, it is really an experience uh, purchased by VMware uh, somewhat recently, right? But and if you're answering the question, say your Active Directory is slow, is DNS responding slow? Again, all those kind of user experience things, um, Nance is, is the product for that. These other three can give you that kind of performance information, but a little more security based, right? Once I have that full payload, I could do really interesting things uh, around it, right? In terms of um, doing security and, and answering a whole lot of questions um, that really only having that entire payload uh, allows me to answer. On the right hand side, again, a little bit different. A lot of these products will kind of do the quality experience, but um, now that everybody's working from home, right, it can be difficult to, to troubleshoot your end users, right? The, the it's slow problem, um, right? You, you just don't have your normal tooling. You can't walk to their desk. Um, they're not on your network. They're not uh, monitoring anything um, you know, via SNMP or, or what have you. So a few products, again, not extensive, just ones I'm familiar with. Um, thousand eyes, right? They actually have a device you put on the network or a VM that will kind of do synthetic transactions is typically the verbiage, right? They can simulate a, a SIP call um, and give you MOS scores and, and uh, things like that. Or an agent, right? It can actually sit on an endpoint and also simulate uh, or kind of generate that synthetic traffic to give me, uh, you know, latency generator, packet loss and, and other key metrics around experience. Um, NetBees, again, happens to be uh, another one. Um, that's just software, or uh, they used to run on Raspberry Pis. I don't know if that's true anymore, but uh, again, a device you could put um, on a network. And again, it can be very handy for remote locations too, um, in addition to you know, end users. But then we're seeing a lot of quality experience stuff just built into SD-WAN and SASE, right? They see the full network flow. Um, you know, some of them can you know, see payload or not. Um, but again, we're seeing a lot of this kind of wrapped into um, current, you know, kind of gen SD-WAN and, and SASE offerings. So um, now it kind of covers it in terms of, you know, monitor my devices, seeing the traffic's actually flowing, and then, um, you know, seeing even a, a greater um, um, insight into the actual traffic, uh, and getting user experience and, and um, that type of information. Beyond that, there is more information uh, we can really get out of our network, right? So. Um, syslog, I mentioned SNMP traps. That's one way to kind of get logging out. Um, but uh, most network devices can actually export log information. I call that syslog. Again, this is generally stored on the device, but with a limited you know, capacity, 
oftentimes it's not stored there very long. I've also had, you know, many times in my career where I log in, you know, I want to go look at the log, but it's just absolutely being spammed by either port flapping or a fan failure or a VLAN mismatch or something like that that just like, totally spams the logs and really loses any history. So um, export it off the box, right? Get it off the switch, off the firewall. Uh, and the syslog server is uh, highly advantageous. So a few types of syslog servers. Um, you probably all heard of a SIEM, a security information and event management server. So this generally ingests logs typically in firewalls and endpoint products. We have an EBR or something like that. Um, and again, it's more for event correlation, right? So, hey, I'm getting feeds from everything. I can go in and correlate all those events. Um, and I threw another one on here uh, that I've used many times in the past, Kiwi. Um, it's been around for a long, long time. SolarWinds actually uh, acquired it. Um, they're kind of a freemium model. But again, if you have nothing in place today, worst case, right, have Kiwi and, and, and send your, your logs over to it. And then also very important information about our network are config configuration files, right? Um, especially if you have uh, maybe too many cooks in the kitchen and someone makes a change, um, you know, change management, like, hey, you shouldn't change that. I saw that you made this, this change at this point in time. It also answers that, hey, did anything change, right? You roll in on a Monday and then something doesn't work and you're asking around and nobody made a change and then you find it and you say, hey, I found this, I'm like, oh, that thing. Um, and anyway, it's probably all happened to all of us. Uh, again, I know it's happened to me. Uh, feels like a disproportionate amount of times. Um, but again, taking regular backups, right? You can do diffs of those, right? Um, and see what the, the changes were. So again, uh, a few other products, these uh, will happen to be open source slash freemium. Um, Rancid, very old. Um, not that it's not valid. Uh, it's just been around for, for a very long time. And then rconfig, it's a little more current. You can do a little more kind of automation, DevOps um, things on that. But at the end of the day, they'll you know, want some kind of cron uh, scheduled task. They can go in and, and back up those config files. All right, so um, as far as monitoring, that's about the, the tools in the toolbox, but that's not at all the, the end of, you know, kind of this day two, uh, monitoring your network, managing your network, right? So um, I often get asked, hey, Jeremy, when should I patch, right? Well, when should I patch my firewall and, and switches and, and access points? Um, and I, you know, I have very specific uh, advice for that, right? Um, generally, if it's working, right, there's no reason to hit a maintenance window and then try and update that. Um, however, there are three very specific times that you should do that. Um, one of them is just bug fixes, right? Reliability. Uh, if you hit something that's not working, hey, you know, and there's a patch, um, go ahead and, and of course, you know, patch that, right? Um, generally, I want to read the change log, see if I can find my issue there. Uh, last just effort, if you are troubleshooting and stuff just isn't working, um, patching can be a valid way to do it. In my experience, it generally doesn't fix it. If anything, maybe more the reboot fixed it than an actual patch. Um, and again, some reason not to be up to date, but generally I don't go out of my way unless you know, there's a good reason to, to do that. Um, next one is uh, new features, right? Oftentimes, especially on firewalls, right? They're releasing new features you know, all the time. So uh, if a new feature comes out you want, of course, hey, let's upgrade. Um, but with that, I've also seen regressions, right? Regressions are introducing, introducing old bugs. Um, right, software is hard, and there's probably some giant Git repo, and there's pull requests and merges, and um, again, it is definitely possible to reintroduce a bug again being a, a regression. But again, new feature, absolutely go for it. And then the biggie, security, right? Um, if there is a security vulnerability in your gear, um, of course we need a patch. And um, luckily, um, in CVEs, the common vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, there's a, a zero to 10 scale, right? So really anything over a seven to eight is normally pretty, pretty insane. Um, tens are pretty rare, but things like log4j, um, right? Those, those hit our, our, our tens. Um, but yes, uh, of course, update right away. But you can also prioritize, right? Uh, if it's a firewall vulnerability and you have any exposure, right? Hit that right away. Um, if you have an internal appliance, uh, Pulse Secure, Citrix, or VMware Horizon, who's Kind of been owned by Long4j, um, right? If you've exposed, if you've added it, that same you know falls in that same domain of it being probably accessible. Um, switches, access points, um, again, those would be more. Someone attacker needs a foothold in your network. Doesn't make them less important, but maybe you know prioritize. It's not a, a fire drill as much as hey, we can wait until our next you know change 
um, you know, meeting, change uh, control meeting, or again, a maintenance window, depending um, if you have a 24 seven environment or not. So getting information about the security um, vulnerabilities can, can be somewhat challenging, right? So each manufacturer, it's up to them to communicate that information to you. And that communication seems to be all over the place in terms of how it's done. Right, so oftentimes there's some email feed that you can, um, you know, sign into. But you know, if it's a vendor with a large portfolio, right, that has a, everything on the sun with the word 40 in front of it, um, you might just get a lot of noise, right? There might just be a ton of noise and, and things that aren't applicable, right? So, um, you know, uh, but there's also vendors do great. I call out Cisco here almost. Um, you can subscribe to email. We can drill down into you know the family, right? I want to get everything on switches. Or even, hey, all I have is 360 X's in my environment. Tell me about those, right? Um, some do RSS. Again, I mentioned the, the 40. Um, you know, most of theirs is delivered over RSS. You need some way to consume that. You get everything they have generally goes into one feed. So um, the point of that is you should be subscribed in your manufacturers, however they're going to give you these, um, and try and keep up to date on, on, on security. Beyond the manufacturers communicating, um, there are some government organizations that, that, that do the same, right? So uh, CISA being a, a cybersecurity and information security agency, um, they kind of keep out for these big ones. They're also the ones that mandate the government agencies patch. Like, hey, we have Log4j, you know, nobody's going on Christmas break because I hear right before Christmas. And so we're, we patch Log4j, right? So, um, but they also um, have email lists and the such for the public. Um, so probably not a bad idea to at least, you know, stay the, the posture that, that the government feels that they need to be at at a minimum. Um, beyond that, we also have the, the US CERT, that's the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team. Um, so um, they also have great communications around, um, hey, we see new vulnerabilities, and you know, here's how we feel that they should be patched. Um, and then a place, another place to get CVEs, which again, vendor neutral, is NIST, the natural, National Institute uh, uh, of Standards and Technology. They run the, the National Vulnerability Database for the NBD. So um, again, another great place for CVEs. And the NVD is actually how we consume uh, CVE information. So um, I wrote some custom scripting that hits their API every few hours. Um, you know, we've scripted down to just the, the equipment we support for our clients, which actually spans like 12 different manufacturers from firewalls to switches to, to access points for our clients, right? So we consume that information, open a ticket in our system, um, look at you know what equipment is affected, uh, and then of course we schedule with our clients to um, you know, hit the maintenance window and um, you know get them patched, right? Especially uh, those uh, eight out of ten, ten out of tens, and, and ten out of tens. All right, so um, to kind of put visually uh, what this looks like in terms of uh, ma managing and, and monitoring, um, I can go ahead and kind of step through our Meraki environment to see how we have it set up what information we're exporting. And then kind of the other side of that, as I mentioned, we have AVIC that we use for our end clients. And we also use that for our internal monitoring too. So here on the Meraki dashboard, um, you can come down and uh, Meraki apps is called their flow information traffic analysis, right? So again, on Meraki, that's an enable disable. Um, and then, you know, how specific do I wanna get on that, that uh, flow information? So reporting host names, uh, you know, I'll show you what that looks like. It really is the, the equivalent of, of general flow information. And then syslogging, um, again, Meraki actually has great retention on their event, uh, but there are things that just don't go into their event log, right? So we do actually um, send all the flow information on our syslog servers. However, it's very hard to consume, right? When it goes into, a, a, I guess, real commercial NetFlow or uh, NetFlow collector on the flow side, Right, generally there's visualizations and ways to consume that. This is just raw text, so it's better than nothing, but uh, again, it's difficult to, to parse out if you ever need it for incident response or something like that. Um, and then SNMP, right? So again, version 2C, there's our super secret community string. And then, you know, if I go to version three, as I mentioned, I uh, username and password. Um, when you enable version three, there's actually a lot more dropdowns here. Meraki, being Meraki, tries to make this simple. Um, if you look at documentation, there's actually um, several other, you know, ciphers and encryption and um, other things that you would see in most other products. And Rocky just kind of standardizes those for you. So you just have to match those on your, your tooling side in terms of well, what Rocky wants to use um, for, again, those additional 
uh, encryption and, and security setting. And then the actual flow information, right? So that's an LNR of switches. Um, you now, if I, I drill down here, um, so I'll just choose, I'll choose Avic. Um, so this section, Avic agent, uh, call it collector, sitting in our environment. So uh, if I come look, here's the, the flow information in Meraki. Um, and here's everything we'd expect, right? So we have you know, source, um, you know, being the actual Avic appliance, um, IP address down here. And then um, destination, right? Protocol, port, um, you know, size, uh, amount of flows. So um, again, that's really what kind of that flow information looks like. And of course, we can see here, um, you know, our good old SNMP part, right? UDP 161. Um, so uh, again, Great that Meraki has this flow information, but it's somewhat limited in terms of choosing time of day and size. And um, you know, I'll show you on the Avic side kind of what a more traditional collector looks like in terms of the information that it gives you. So Avic, um, first uh, let's kind of look at, you know, how we set things up. So again, like all of these toolings, right? We need to set up the SNMP credentials, uh, log in CLI. Uh, Avic is one of those tools that can log into the CI and you can dump those things like the MAC address table, ARP table, um, you know, CDP, ODP neighbor, um, and et cetera. And then API, uh, again, we are Cisco Meraki. There is no CLI for how we can log into, right? So um, a lot of information, um, again, we don't get it over SNMP, so we actually get it over the, the Meraki API. So uh, if I look at any of our equipment here, I'll try to choose this as a, you know, an access switch for us, a PLE access switch. So things we get over traditional over SNMP, right? You get make and model, um, you know, IP address, serial number, Typically, these are you know, in the description field. Again, um, in, that, um, in the MIB, there's an RFC MIB that kind of standardizes what OIDs uh, you can implement, right? So uh, again, a lot of these are just kind of standard OIDs, uh, part of the RFC-based MIBs. Actually, you get uptime, uh, also over SNMP. Um, and then again, bandwidth, right? So here we can see you know, kind of granularity, uh, one minute polls, right, as I mentioned. Most SNMP-based polling is either in one minute or five minute increments. So then Avic allows me to kind of drill down in there, um, you know, and then look at each individual interface and, um, you know, the, the average and, and the high and all that. Um, this is one thing that um, Meraki does not give you, actually, is, you know, kind of this packets per second, right? So, and when we talk about packets per second, um, again, we'll touch on this in troubleshooting here in the next section. But you know, this is important for the, the back end of the SIT, right? So and broadcast are set to everybody in my subnet, multicast is a special kind of 224 subnet, and then unicast is just um, you know, una being one flow in between um, two different uh, endpoints, right? Uh, Meraki does not report a CPU and memory over SNMP, but um, any traditional switch would. And then um, lastly, errors and discards, right? And again, I'll touch on this on the troubleshooting, but that's gonna be port statistics. Uh, which is typically, you know, delivered over those SNMP counters, right? Um, you know, what bandwidth is on the port, and then any you know, error counters that might be on the port. So um, again, basic information that we're going to get over SNMP really from, from any device. And then uh, again, you saw that we are exporting syslog information. So if I come like at you know logs, um, here's one from our uh, PoE switch here. And again, we can see that you know this port changed from disabled to designated, right? Spain tree roll. So um, in English, something got plugged into to port 38, right? Um, so you know, it looks like it went from down into a blazing 10 megabit full duplex. So anyway, having this information again from a firewall, typically you're gonna have much more um, you know, security kind of based uh, information. And then lastly, NetFlow, right? So uh, again, Meraki is great, has flow information. Uh, as you'll see here, um, it's not as robust as you know, kind of more of a commercial product, right? So uh, again, application breakdown, right? We can see uh, over time, very granular because we're getting every flow, right? We're not just pulling things. Um, again, I can see what protocols are on my network, uh, TCP, UDP, you know, ICMP, um, and then uh, top. So um, in most uh, NetFlow parlance, this would be the top talkers. Right. Who do I generally care about my network um, if there are saturation, right? I care about the top talkers, right? The people sending the most information. 
So here I can kind of see the top sources and destinations, um, conversations, you know, being, um, you know, kind of a culmination of the source and destination matched, and then, you know, port numbers, right? Uh, Avacap is a geo location, so it uses um, the source and destination IP addresses to kind of draw a heat map of, of where my traffic is going. And then flows, right? As I mentioned, we do um, send flows to our syslog server. Uh, however, it's you know, very difficult um, to kind of you know go in and parse that out, right? So um, a lot of flow information here. A little surprised it's floating this uh, long. Um, so this does uh, load again, gives me really great information flow by flow in terms of you know source IP address, uh, destination IP address, port number protocol. There we go. All right. Um, so when, when the flow started, the flow ended. Again, this is a conversation, right? So the flows can last for for quite some time. Um, as we can see, all these flows are, are quite small, right? So again, source, source port, destination, destination port. Uh, we see this is you know HTTPS looks like with SSL. Um, the AS number, right? If it's public, um, the IP address can be associated with some uh, autonomous system number, BGP on the internet, um, you know, countries, you know, bytes, flows, etc. So um, again, if you're troubleshooting, or if you, you know, unfortunately find yourself doing an incident response um, due to security events, um, knowing exactly who talked to you for how long, really great. But again, no payloads, right? Uh, but metadata is sure a lot better than, than nothing at all. So. All right, so uh, in terms of you know, monitoring our network, uh, again, that's a little fast and furious, but those are, are generally, right, do I pull it, uh, drive it, send me net metadata, or do I try and do some kind of mirror port scan port and actually you know, get payloads of that? So now we're gonna move on to troubleshooting, right? Um, so uh, this slide is a little bit like, you know, uh, probably no duh, but <laughs> if you haven't thought about it in a while, um, there's kind of those general best practices for how to approach troubleshooting. Uh, don't worry, next slide I'll be touching on product by product, kind of what we see the, the most common areas of troubleshooting being or issues coming up, right? So, uh, of course, we need information about the problem, right? The four W's being who, what, when, and where. Um, typically, these are going to be your end users, um, you know, trying to communicate this to you, right? If something wasn't working, um, right? Uh, you know, who, what, when, where, why. Again, yeah, that can be very important. Um, knowing that, you know, in my experience and users aren't made necessarily the best, you need the best, most information, but if you're multi-site that it happened at this location, or you're on wires, wires, wired or wireless, right? The application we're using, was that internal or external, right? You knowing what the traffic flow is, like over VPN or MPLS or uh, ENS or uh, so on and so forth, right? What was the endpoint doing? Um, so yeah, those are all, you know, information you absolutely need before you even start to think about troubleshooting. Um, our approach, uh, again, your network first, is really to follow that OSI model, right? Uh, we have layer, layer one being physical, uh, layer two being Ethernet, I, you know, layer three IP, um, up to, to TCP, and then, of course, layer seven, right? Um, a lot of times I find people want to jump straight to layer seven, right, right to the application layer. Um, but that can be very misleading because there are six layers below that that all need to work correctly for that layer seven to work correctly. So typically when I start at the bottom, right? Hey, you know, our MAC address is good, our ARP table is good. IP is, is routing good, um, you know, do I have, you know, uh, duplicate IP addresses or, or something like that, right, IP conflict. So um, again, we really like to follow kind of that OSI model and not just jump straight to that application layer. Um, knowing that more than times than not, it is, but, um, you know, not difficult to kind of check the, the, the plumbing first as it will. Diagrams, um, you know, when we walk to an environment and, and someone's having a, a network issue, um, understanding that physical topology Right, and if you have a logical diagram, that's really helpful too. Um, but more than that, that physical topology really gives us a better idea of hey, what's going where, right? If I have a problem with the switch in the middle, and we see that everybody else having a problem is downstream, right? It's going to give us a really good idea, or everyone on a specific VLAN, right? Again, that's more of a logical diagram. Um, yeah, a little bit no brainer, but cut it in half, right? In terms of hey, you know, if it's a client server issue, right? Opposed to trying to troubleshoot that end to end. Trying to emulate, you know, hey, from where I am, how's my access to the server? From where I am, how's my access to the client? Right? To try and, oh, I see this as you know, a client issue more than a server issue, or vice versa. Um, and I threw the last follow-up point on there as a little bit of a joke. Um, me and a, a lot of IT friends uh, always say, yeah, it's, it's just always DNS, um, which amazing amount of times it is DNS, right? 
um, stale records or zone transfers not working or TTL is too short or TTL is too long um, or you know uh, just not resolving. So uh, again, no we'll, we'll, we'll joke there on the Gideon side. All right. So um, when we talk about actual you know physical equipment, where do we commonly see issues, right? Um, first of all, bullet point tooling. Hopefully, all this tooling we've deployed, um, SNMP based, flow based, um, you know, span based, tap based, syslog, um, you know, gives us a good idea of what's happening on our network. Um, but beyond that, so issues we normally see on the firewalls, right? Um, outside of the, you know, NAT rules wrong or, or, or firewall rules is wrong, right? Um, those are generally pretty, you know, uh, you know, true or false. It, it works or it doesn't work, right? But it's when we get those gremlins, right? When things just aren't working consistently or working, um, you know, appropriately, that's more of the troubleshoot I'm talking about in almost all of these. So resources, right? Firewalls are little boxes with a finite amount of CPU and finite amount of RAM. Right? They don't have so many resources. So more times uh, when I see firewall issues, a lot of times it's, hey, you know, you went and got a gig circuit because it was cheap, but your firewall is rated at 200 megabit, right? And when you try and push gig through it, you just max this poor box out. And it does that whole default queuing thing we talked about on quality of service, right? Not enough resources. So it just starts shedding packets. But again, this can be very hit or miss depending how much bandwidth you're pushing through or not. But again, with all your tooling, hopefully you know the CPU and RAM uh, of your firewall, right? So uh, again, bandwidth, generally CPU, RAM, generally floats. Right? We have this NAT table we have to keep track of, right? Um, you're right? When we talk about DPI and all this, right? We're keeping track of state. We keep track of state. We don't generally keep that on a hard drive. That's too slow. We keep that in RAM. So um, that's why you often see firewalls also measured in amount of flows, right? Amount of NAT connections, amount of end users. That's them trying to communicate how much RAM's in there. Enabled features. This can go right into resources, right? Um, you bought this firewall and on the box it said, you know, 15 gigabit. Um, that's great until you turn on TLS decryption and uh, gateway anti-malware and gateway antivirus and full content filtering and um, you know you, you enable all the things, which is great. That's what you bought it for. But that takes it from many, 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 many gigabits down to often sub gigabit, um, which that can also eat into your CPU too. Uh, enabled features also falls under sabotaging. Um, oftentimes on the vendor, again, being voice-based SIP ALG, SIP Application Layer Gateway, um, it's old technology trying to help you know SIP get through NAT. That's just not a real problem anymore. Um, but it can often get in the way and then mess up SIP traffic. You know, just a specific example uh, being in the waste industry. Then MTU, maximum transmission unit. We didn't really talk about this last time, but um, you know, this is generally more of a layer two thing. Um, we're talking about Ethernet, which might Ethernet frames. Typically they won't be so many bytes. That's our maximum transmission unit. Um, I've seen it both ways where we do jumbo frames, which is generally 9,000 plus bytes. You try to send that across a 1500 byte uh, MTU, um, it gets fragmented or drops. Um, other ones we see, is, especially with SDWAN or IPsec, is there's a tunnel overhead, right? The tunnel takes so much traffic, so our MTU is closer to 1300, um, to where some applications don't like to be fragmented. So it can either be slow or just really intermittent. So, uh, switching a bunch here, this is the, the backbone uh, of our, our, our network. So um, again, saturation. Right, um, can be one, right? Um, if it's slow or packet screen drops, it's because we're saturating the interfaces. Also, the backplane, um, right? We do see on kind of consumer, prosumer switches that the backplane is typically half. By backplane, I mean you have 24 ports on the front, those are all connected in the, the back of the switch, right? The backplane. Um, when you think about a switch port, it can actually be two gigabit, right? Another one gig ports, but we can get one gig flows in either direction, right? So a 24 port switch should have 48 gigabit backplane. Uh, again, your ubiquities of the world to call them out, right? 24 port switch actually generally has a 24 bit gigabit backplane, right? So if I light up 13 ports, um, you know, full duplex book lays, I can actually saturate that the backbone. Then we get that typical behavior of default queuing being just the indiscriminately shutting packets. MTU, uh, again, similar on the firewall, uh, also similar on the switching side. Um, when we are troubleshooting, port counters are our friends. Uh, again, I kind of touched on AVIC. But on um, your Cisco uh, iOS, like this would be a show int, show interface. Um, I always see CRC errors and, and runs and uh, overruns and all these things. Um, when we see those counters fail or increment, um, typically those are cabling issues. 
patch cable or something, you know, in the structure of cabling of the building, or uh, failing network card. I've seen that in both, but that can also again exhibit itself as really intermittent, weird uh, gremlins for for end users. Um, queues again, quality service um, is really what I'm referring to here. Uh, as I showed in the, the last one, today we have you know kind of different queues um, on the, the cost side, right? The, the cost of service that layer two. Um, there's something called policing, and getting it really into it on, on quality service. But um, you know, essentially, depending how aggressive you are on quality service, um, you might only allow certain traffic to use you know a fifth of the bandwidth. Um, so we can actually just get shedding of you know indiscriminate shedding of packets in a single queue. So again, it can also feel kind of random, right? Some traffic is just fine, some traffic is impacted. Uh, trunk and access, this is really talking about VLANs and VLAN mismatches. Um, we see this fairly commonly. Um, another thing that can spam the logs if you're not paying attention um, to where you, know, you didn't set the native VLANs correctly or one side's a trunk, one side's access. Weird stuff can happen again, depending on the manufacturer's implementation. And then good old packet capture, right? We talked about mirror port, scan port. Um, the biggest tool in the space is Wireshark. Right to where um, you know if you're having application issues, it's more layer seven. Could be layer three, layer four too. Right? If you're troubleshooting spanning tree and you want to see what that looks like on the wire, you could do Wireshark. You actually just do it on your PC that you probably sit in front of um, on an enterprise network. But um, nothing is really the truth like the packets on the wire, right? So the packet capture, packet capture is a big one, especially when we're doing voice or troubleshooting SIP trunking or something. Um, that's a big one. And then wireless. As I mentioned last time, um, not only could I talk an hour about wireless, I could probably talk an hour about wireless troubleshooting. I'll hit the biggies here that we often see, right? Um, basements, right? Access points want to be um, generally horizontal. Right? Some people throw them up on a wall, um, right? We get a radiation pattern out of the access point. Um, it's kind of a donut. It doesn't shoot out the front um, unless you have a patch or a, a you know some other sector panel, right? Antenna or something like that. So um, general rule of thumb, the thing should always be on the ceiling. Um, and again, polarity comes into play and, and other things, but really we, you know, most people expect that the radiation may go out. So um, it's amazing how many times I walked in and APs on the wall and things don't work well. Channel interference, again, I kind of touched on this last time, um, but really, you know, that's why we use five gigahertz. That's why we're excited about six gigahertz uh, as far as spectrum, but right, wireless is a shared medium. So, um, you know, it's kind of a crazy thing about, but two people cannot talk at the same time. Right, we actually kind of do time sharing to where everybody gets to talk um, at a specific time, right? So um, if two access points are listening to each other, they have to listen to their clients. Each one has to listen to their clients and they have to listen to each other, right? So with wireless being a shared medium, that dramatically can cut down our air time, right? Less air time means less time for people to talk, less bandwidth. So um, again, can't stress on this enough. We actually use a professional tool in an investment called Echohow. So um, it allows us to kind of do a, a spectrum analysis see what the channel interference looks like. Um, it's also the tool we use to do kind of predictive surveys, right? If you come to us and say, hey, you need to, you know, wireless for this building, we don't just kind of stick our finger in the air and figure it out, right? Or, you know, just kind of jot down, oh, it should be about right, right? It's just simulate the environment, so. Um, wireless, too many APs or not enough APs? Also very common, right? Too many APs or too close, channel interference, they can hear each other, right? Too close, you also normally get aggressive roaming, right? To where clients will kind of bot back and forth um, which can be disruptive to the client. And also see not enough a uh, lot too, especially when people you know had a 2.4 gigahertz network at some point in time. Now they're moving to five and six, penetration is not the same. So uh, again, something like that Echo House software that we have, uh, we do a site survey to determine too hot, too cold, um, right? Whether it be too hot, we can't turn on the radio and there's a, a minimum BSS rate that, um, you know, it's not there on wireless. And then client count. This one is, um, you know, on the box, I might say you can have 256 clients on this AP. That's more like there's some register in the access point that can technically keep track of 256 access or uh, MAC addresses. Ideally, I like those less than 20 or 30. Um, again, right, there's a shared medium. Each client gets a certain amount of time to talk. If I have 256 clients, they all get just a teeny amount of time to talk, meaning close to zero bandwidth, right? Um, plus amount of airtime and, and so on and so forth. Um, I didn't put on this, again, I mentioned last time, three SSIDs or less, again, that's also just an airtime thing um, that we see. All right, the dreaded, it's slow, right? Um, again, my career can tell me how many times, um, they don't tell you what application they're using or what the endpoint was or that day, right? It's just, it's slow. 
Um, so uh, how do we walk through that, right? What, what areas can we look at for its slope? So um, probably the easiest um, one that will probably jump at you the, the closest is saturation again, right? Um, if I have an uplink saturated or a, a, a port to an endpoint is saturated, um, again, we can only fill a gigabit after that, nothing gets through, right? So, um, and again, as I mentioned on the first one, that could be, you know, if you daisy chain switches, saturation, um, resources. So this is kind of a, um, again, if we're ever going through a, um, going through a firewall, um, anything like that, right? In terms of, hey, you know, are there enough resources along the path, right? If we're talking about a WAN, uh, this could be, you know, IPsec uh, between them, um, right? And, and again, we're doing things on the firewall. So, you know, do we just have a, a, a enough resources, again, CPU, RAM, et cetera, uh, along the path, right? Um, between my endpoint, right? Uh, typically when it's slow, it should be end user to an application, end user to a, a, a website, uh, et cetera, right? Um, could be the endpoint itself, right? This is the kind of cut in half, right? Hey, if we look from the middle towards the endpoint or if we look from the middle towards the, the, the application or the server, um, where along that path, you know, do we uh, initially jump out at us? So, um, but it could be the endpoint itself, right? It could be like, you know, look at any virus running right now or a Windows update or something that's an accident, 100% of the CPU running around on it, right? Or it could be the connectivity, right? They could have the not enough AP problem or uh, there could be 100 people on the access point, right? Um, so it could just be how they're connected uh, into the network to try and access the resource, right? So, um, or it could be the other side, right? It could be the application or the server. Uh, be and again, resource on the server, right? Uh, does the database server at 100%? Um, you know, it, it, could, it could be the application itself, right? I've seen a lot of really poorly tuned SQL uh, loads, right? SQL servers to where, um, you know, they're just not giving um, records fast enough. And it's maybe server storage, right? Maybe your SAN is undersized and you don't have enough IOPS, right? Um, any transaction to it is taking uh, several seconds, right? It should be measured in hopefully five milliseconds or less uh, to your storage, or 10 milliseconds or less uh, round trip, right? So seconds really start to matter here. Um, and then of course, it is probably just DNS still at the end of the day. Um, anyway, uh, that was uh, hopeful. Yeah, when we're talking troubleshooting, it's hard to really talk in generic terms, right? Uh, when you have a specific problem, it's much easier to go through and, and logically um, troubleshoot that, knowing that every environment's different, applications are different. Um, so that wraps up session two of the Reset Bootcamp, um, monitoring and troubleshooting. Well done, Jeremy. Great information. With over 100 IT professionals on this call, I'm sure everybody walked away with a tidbit and a nugget. Um, to take back to the team. You know, we could have spent this uh, entire session chock full of testimonials and case studies, client interviews, um, but A, no one would have attended. And B, uh, you know, we're all about the agnostic education here, but it's important for me to mention that everything you saw today is what we do day in and day out with our product. Internally, we call this MNET, Matrix Managed Network. This isn't about displacing jobs. It's about making you look like rock star IT professionals that you are. So if you'd like to take a, a longer conversation on what we can do from a managed network perspective, please reach out to your Matrix Networks account executive. Another great solution in our portfolio is Entirety. And if you were one of the lucky few that registered in the first 100, you received a pretty awesome mole skin in the mail along with an insert from Entirety. Scan that QR code, set up a little meeting to discuss um, what they can do for your organization. Um, I'll admit I'm not the best person to talk about the specialties of Entirety, but I know who is. Jeremy Ness, everybody. Jeremy, why do we love Entirety so much? Uh, yeah, absolutely. They're definitely one of our security partners. So here at Matrix, um, I'd like say we you know, stay in our lane in terms of we do network really well, right? Wireless and switching uh, firewalls and really that, that multi-site. Um, and of course, you know, we do voice, but we do not do security. Um, we do sell security appliances. We assist our clients in setting up firewall rules and um, MFA for VPNs and, you know, um, all security around the infrastructure. But security is not set it and forget it, right? Someone needs to be there, um, you know, monitoring and managing it. So Entirety is an MSSP, uh, Managed Security Solutions Provider um, or Service Provider. Um, being, you know, they do everything like running a, a SOC, right, a security operations center. Uh, I mentioned the SIM, right, they uh, can operate a SIM, 
uh, you know, ingest all of your logs from your endpoints, security appliances, switches. Um, and then in that sock, right, they have the, the eyes on glass, right, 24 seven, um, right? So again, attackers like to, you know, attack on, you know, Thanksgiving weekend and, and, and such um, to where, you know, you're probably hopefully off and enjoying things and, you know, uh, they're still um, staffed in there. Let's do endpoint security, right? So again, that's not a set in, forget it, right? So we need to be sitting there um, seeing um, what's going on. Let's do security training. Right? We need to tell our end users, no, seriously, don't click on that email, right? Or, hey, you know, they're calling up and they're trying to socially engineer you, right? Like your end users, um, they're always trying to help your clients out, but sometimes it's not always your clients, right? Uh, can do uh, patching, vulnerability management, um, you know, things like uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, pen testing, right? So um, really they're a, a go-to partner that we love to loop in and then refer our clients to uh, for all of their security needs could not have said it better myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> and thank you to Entirety uh, for sponsoring session two of Reset Land Management Bootcamp. It's been our pleasure. Hope you enjoy the content. We really look forward to seeing you at session three next week, where we'll be talking about future-proofing your network for things such as Wi-Fi 6 and beyond. Until then, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Mm -hmm.